Hello and welcome to the first half of lecture number 13 on sedative hypnotic and anxiolytic medications. The drugs we're going to talk about uh, in these uh, lectures are specifically designed to cause sedation, that is to help people sleep or to alleviate anxiety. In this first half we're going to talk about the historical background of treating anxiety and what anxiety is. Then we will spend some time talking about the mechanism of action of most uh, sedative hypnotics, talk about sedative induced amnesia, and then specifically talk about barbiturates and their tra tragic history. In the second half, we'll talk about benzodiazepines and their alternatives. Uh, for now, let's start off talking about the historical background uh, of treating anxiety. So anxiety disorders were first introduced in the Diagnostic and, St Diagnosis and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in its third edition. Since then, they have been expanded to several categories, uh, but generally, this is a common type of psychiatric disorder characterized by excessive rumination, worry, uneasiness, apprehension, and fear about future uncertainties, either based on real or imagined events which may affect both physical and psychological health. Approximately 18% of Americans suffer from some form of anxiety, so this is one of the most common forms of um, mental disease or disorder that we will talk about. Uh, some of the drugs we'll talk about uh, during this discussion are some of the most commonly prescribed medications in the United States. So anxiety is a serious problem. So specifically we usually talk about anxiety as including generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, obsessive, com well sorry, obsessive compulsive disorder used to be an anxiety disorder, uh, and then finally phobic disorders. Generally the drugs we're going to talk about are used to treat generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorder, but not to treat phobias um, and uh, generally not to treat uh, some of the other types of anxiety we'll talk about. So early on, uh, we have uh, early sedatives, including uh, the mid-19th century bromides and chloral hydrate were introduced as alternatives to alcohol and, o alcohol and opium. In the early uh, 20th century, phenobarbital was introduced as the first barbiturate. There are about 50 different barbiturates marketed between 1912 and 1950, so a pretty extensive uh, catalog of different barbiturates. In the 1960s, we start to get to the introduction of benzodiazepine sedatives. So in 1960, chlorodiazepoxide, which is Librium, was introduced. This was the first benzodiazepine to be marketed. In 1963, Valium, which is diazepam, was introduced. And this became the most prescribed drug in the United States from 1969 to 1982. We'll talk uh, next about <coughs> how uh, benzodiazepines became part of the social fabric and certainly a target. So, uh, and barbiturates. In fact, we'll talk about the Valley of the Dolls uh, as referring specifically to barbiturates. In fact, the dolls they refer to are actual pills. Um, there is some belief that uh, these drugs were prescribed specifically to keep women in their place. Uh, that is sort of part of the uh, discussion of the reason these drugs were prescribed to so many women because they were the most uh, likely person to be prescribed these specific drugs. So in both Valley of the Dolls and in the Feminine Mystique, uh, these are, as well as, sorry I might note, um, the Stepford Wives. Uh, they are this a reaction to this medicating of housewives in America and so uh, certainly became uh, a target of uh, the feminine, feminist movement. Uh, if you want to see a full sort of review of this history you should read Happy Pills in America by David Hertzberg. So that's a little bit of the history, certainly some controversy, lots of psychiatrists and general practitioners prescribing these sedatives, very powerful sedatives. Um, <coughs> the way these drugs work, uh, they tend to be classified by structure instead of effects. Today we tend to classify drugs by their effects, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors have that effect of selecting, of select, of rep, inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin. In the past, drugs were more classified based on their structure uh, because really uh, pharmacists were chemists. Uh, in fact, in the UK they're still called the chemist shop. Um, and so uh, we talk about tricyclics, it's a type of antidepressant we'll talk about later, barbiturates, we'll talk about here a little bit today, uh, and benzodiazepines, which we'll also talk about 
uh, in uh, the second half of this particular lecture. Uh, today we would refer to barbiturates and benzodiazepines as GABA receptor agonists. So that is how they work. They agonize uh, the GABA receptor. And remember, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So obviously these drugs function by inhibiting neurotransmission. So as we know, GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so substances that are GABA agonists inhibit neuronal firing. There are specific receptor sites for both barbiturates and benzodiazepines. Uh, some drugs are benzodiazepine receptor agonists, uh, so they are um, specific to the benzodiazepine receptor, but are not benzodiazepines themselves, so drugs such as Zolpidem, which is Ambien. Uh, other receptors uh, on this, in this particular area include alcohol and the uh, various anesthetics. So all of these uh, GABA receptor agonists um, influence uh, the firing of GABA. So while there are specific sites for benzodiazepines, drugs such as Zolpidem um, are benzodiazepine receptor agonists. So they are not benzodiazepines, but they certainly agonize that receptor. So if we take a look at um, this kind of receptor, there are receptor sites for propofol, steroids, halothane, and ethanol. Um, there are barbiturate sites, and then benzodiazepine sites. So um, drugs such as Zolpidem are benzodiazepine agonists, whereas benzodiazepines bond directly to uh, the benzodiazepine site itself, which facilitate the influx of chloride ions, uh, or the transfer of chloride ions, which inhibit neural firing. So benzodiazepines exert their anxiolytic properties by acting in the limbic system, primarily the amygdala and the orbitofrontal cortex. So that's where the GABA neurons that benzodiazepines have their anxiolytic effect. Unfortunately, there are benzodiazepine and GABA receptors throughout the brain. So sedation, reduction in seizures, cognitive impairment, and muscle relaxation come from the brainstem uh, cortex and the hippocampus. So Valium is a very potent muscle relaxer and that is occurring through uh, activation at the brainstem level. Block of GABA in functioning uh, results in anxiogenic action. So whenever you block GABA, you can actually induce anxiety. So all of these indicate that the benzodiazepine receptor, sorry, the GABA, uh, functioning is related to anxiety by quieting anxiety by quieting GABA. You quiet anxiety by blocking, or sorry, by increasing GABA. You decrease anxiety by decreasing GABA. You increase anxiety. So again, GABA being inhibitory, uh, blocking GABA function can result in anxiogenesis. There are a variety of ways that sedatives can induce uh, temporary amnesia. Of course, alcohol blackouts, high levels of alcohol can result in anterior grade amnesia, something we've discussed previously. Uh, this is even more likely when combined with sedatives, so uh, combining Xanax and alcohol or barbiturates and alcohol are much more likely to result in um, reductions in memory uh, for the event. GABA plays a significant role in this process because memories are thought to be formed by a process known as long-term potentiation. GABA is known to reduce long-term potentiation in the hippocampus, and this is the part of the brain where memories are formed. So significant GABA activation from drugs can therefore result in drug-induced reversible organic brain syndrome. Uh, that is, it looks just like any other kind of amnesia uh, that is reversed once someone is no longer on the drug. Uh, so this is one of the ways in which clinicians uh, particularly anesthesiologists will induce amnesia uh, for certain procedures. And we'll talk about that next. There is some uh, certainly uh, significant potential for abuse at state rate drugs. Uh, all sedatives have the potential to cause amnesia at varying doses because they do influence uh, GABA. Some drugs have potent amnesic effects. Drugs like GHB, Rohypnol, uh, Versed, and Ativan. Versed is uh, the brand name of midazolam, and Ativan is the brand name of lorazepam. Importantly, those under the influence of these drugs are unaware that there is anything wrong with their memory. That is, they do not know that they will not remember later. In a series of experiments we conducted, um, we found that participants under the influence of Versed or midazolam had no idea that there was anything wrong with their memory. 
similar effects have been found with lorazepam uh, and other uh, benzodiazepine sedatives. So something to keep in mind. You don't know there's anything wrong with your memory at the time you're under the influence of these drugs. So there is certainly dangerous potential for abuse as date rape kind of drugs. Versed, very little danger for that one. It's not something that you uh, would ever find. And it's also something that um, breaks down in the GI tract, so it would have to be either um, administered intravenously or intranasally, so it's unlikely to have uh, that kind of abuse potential, but the others certainly do. The clinical uses of these drugs uh, are in conscious sedation procedures. So some clinical procedures require patients to be awake and somewhat responses, responsive. So often they are given midazolam uh, to alleviate anxiety and to keep from remembering unpleasant procedures. So for example, uh, burn patients are often kept on a pretty steady diet of Versed or midazolam in order to prevent the formation of traumatic memories of that treatment. Uh, burn treatment is uh, pretty awful. Um, and so keeping patients on that kind of steady uh, drip of midazolam keeps them from remembering that experience. Uh, barbiturates um, is a class of drugs that aren't used uh, all that often, particularly in the U.S., um, for some reasons we'll talk about. But the indications for this class of drugs uh, is as a general anesthetic for surgery. So we used to use um, sodium amytal or um, sodium pentothal as a general anesthetic uh, prior to development of better drugs like propofol. Uh, they function as anticonvulsants, so as treatments for epilepsy. Uh, they can be used to maintain coma in emergency situations. Uh, that is, if someone's had a head trauma, they can be induced into a coma with barbiturates. We'll talk a little bit about these drugs in treatment of bipolar disorder. Uh, certainly treatment for anxiety and to induce sleep, so somnolescence. Um, unfortunately, they have some pretty um, dramatic dangers that we'll talk about here in a minute. So the pharmacokinetics of, of barbiturates have uh, varying half-lives. They can be short, very short, like three minutes, or very long, up to 48 hours. Uh, Ultra-short-acting are drugs like thiopental extremely lipid soluble, cross the blood-brain barrier rapidly and induce sleep within seconds when given intravenously. The longer acting drugs like amobarbital are more water soluble and are slower to penetrate the central nervous system. You can test for their presence by uh, urinalysis. So let's take a look at uh, some of these barbiturates, barbiturates um, and their elimination half-life. So amytal or amobarbital um, has about a 10 to 40 hour half-life. Um, it's a drug for treating insomnia. If you look at uh, drugs like thiopental, about a 3 to 6 hour half-life, distributed within 3 minutes, um, used only for anesthesia. Um, certainly we'll talk about um, secondol, only for, it shows here that it's used for use um, in insomnia, but actually it's more often used in um, other uses we'll talk about. So taking a close look at the GABA receptor, there are several different pharmacological substances that can modulate the effect of GABA by binding to GABA receptors. Again, these include uh, benzodiazepines, barbiturates, certain steroids, and even alcohol, and they bind to these different sites on the GABA receptors. We call these substances GABA modulators because they increase or decrease the effect of GABA but have no effect in absence of GABA. So they are potentiating the effects of GABA. So modulators that reduce the effectiveness of GABA and hence neuromembranes permeability to chloride ions have an anxiogenic effect, whereas modulators that increase the effectiveness of GABA have an anxiolytic effect. So just a quick review of how these barbiturates are affecting the uh, specific GABA receptors uh, are by agonizing um, or potentiating the effect of GABA itself. So what are the pharmacological effects of barbiturates? Well, they are not analgesic. That is, they do not reliably produce sensation or sleep in the presence of pain. Um, REM sleep, and therefore dreaming, is suppressed 
So oftentimes patients will get vivid and excessive dreaming during withdrawal, which we call REM rebound. Anytime REM sleep has been suppressed, you can go through this period of REM rebound. You also, of course, get cognitive inhibition and sedation, so there is memory impairment, alterations in judgment and cognitive functioning. Uh, there is certainly um, a potent combination with alcohol. These drugs should never be combined with alcohol. So barbiturate alcohol combinations have been implicated in accidental deaths as well as intentional suicides. And in the liver, barbiturates stimulate synthesis of uh, metabolic enzymes producing pretty high tolerance to these drugs. So someone who's been on them for a long time will have pretty high tolerance to them. Uh, and as a result, probably aren't getting much out of them, but would go through pretty significant withdrawal if you took them off them. So um, we get general sort of behavioral, motor, and cognitive inhibitions that are similar to alcohol. Uh, higher doses uh, can lead to general behavioral depression and just overall sleep. Clinical uses of barbiturates has declined for several reasons, and this is a, a clear warning uh, for that. They are very lethal in overdose situations. There is a narrow therapeutic to toxic range. There's a high potential for dependence and abuse. And they are extraordinarily dangerous when interacting with other drugs. So they should not be used in combination with any other drugs, particularly any other sedative drugs, painkillers, alcohol, uh, etc. Because they suppress breathing just like those other drugs. Um, tolerance for barbiturates can be induced in one of two ways. Of course, we get induction of metabolic enzymes in the liver, as already mentioned, and adaptation of neurons to the drug's presence. So they simply you know, adapt to the presence of barbiturates, which is why withdrawal, you can get this physical dependence because um, at this point then uh, GABA will be functioning less well and people will have uh, anxiety as a result. In terms of some non-barbiturates, these structurally resemble barbiturates with slight differences. Uh, these were introduced in the 1950s as anxiolytics, sedatives, and hypnotics, and are now uh, considered medically obsolete, and are occasionally encountered as... So, uh, some of the non-barbiturates that were, have been popular are uh, Soma, which is sometimes used for treating um, Insomnia, uh, methoquilone, which are quaaludes, were quite popular in the 1970s and early 80s. They rivaled alcohol and marijuana in their popularity for abuse. So certainly a high potential for date rape uh, as a date rape drug because the dose to induce anterior grade amnesia is much lower than that for incapacitation. So someone could be awake, responsive, but have no memory for that event. Chloral hydrates in old schools, one of the, of course, the original sedatives we talked about uh, at the beginning of this talk. And then finally, GHB um, has a high toxicity when combined with alcohol. Uh, I think it's really important for you to understand. GHB used to be available in places like uh, GNC because it does actually potentiate uh, the growth of muscle. And so it actually has some use as almost an anabolic steroid. Um, unfortunately, it has a high degree of toxicity when combined with alcohol. People will oftentimes stop breathing uh, and has been implicated as a date rape drug. Barbiturates and non-barbiturates have a pretty strong, uh, very tragic history, um, certainly uh, famous and tragic history. So Marilyn Monroe, for example, is known to have overdosed on both chloral hydrate and pentobarbital combination. Um, so a combination of sleeping pills uh, implicated in her suicide. Uh, both Judy Garland and Dinah Washington um, died from overdoses to secanol or secobarbital. Um, Judy Garland died in uh, June of 1968, uh, and her death is credited for sparking the Stonewall Riots, which started the gay, right, gay, right, gay rights movement in 1969. Uh, Dinah Washington also died from a secanol overdose. Um, I highly recommend looking her up on YouTube. She's a really talented jazz musician, uh, and her loss was really quite tragic. Uh, the final note I want to make on this class of drugs is they are used in both euthanasia and lethal injection. Um, and there is a great deal of controversy surrounding their use in these areas. So secobarbital or secanol is the most commonly prescribed drug for physician-assisted suicide in the United States in those states where that's legal. Um, 
Sodium thiopental was used as a single drug lethal injection drug in the United States uh, prior to a uh, European Union ban on exports to the United States. Uh, so one of the problems with lethal injection is um, doing so humanely and the old three drug combination used a paralytic drug, um, a sedative, and a drug to stop their heart, usually it's potassium chloride. The problem was um, there are allegations that the paralytic drug masked the fact that some people weren't given, some uh, inmates were not given enough drug to of these sodium thiopental uh, or drugs like them uh, so that they weren't rendered unconscious first. So they basically laid there and suffocated. Um, <coughs> so uh, most states moved to a single drug overdose of sodium thiopental. Um, pretty easy, relaxing way to go, frankly. Um, but because capital punishment is outlawed in the European Union, uh, no company is allowed to uh, supply their drugs for uh, injection. And some manufacturers have voluntarily um, removed their drugs and said that they simply cannot be used for such purposes. Uh, it's really created a significant problem uh, in the United States because there are no uh, real alternatives. Um, so regardless of your feelings on the death penalty, it's an issue that you probably hear some more about. Okay, that's um, our introduction to barbiturates and uh, anxiolytic drugs. We'll uh, pick up right here uh, with benzodiazepine sedatives uh, in part two of this lecture.